we're so glad to have you joining us once again virtually. All right, just a friendly reminder about Christmas Eve service. Okay, it's going to be held on, of course, December 24th at 5 p.m. A survey was sent out via email, and if you haven't had the chance to complete it, please try to do so. If you've done it, thank you so much. Um, and it's going to allow us to kind of figure out if we want to add another service. So we'll make sure that we keep you posted on if we do add a 3.30 service or not. Thank you so much. Let's just take a little time and worship in the Lord. Lost and weary traveler Searching for the way to go Stranger, heavy hearted Longing for someone you know May you find the light May you find a light May you find a light to guide you home May you
Hello, it's great to be with you today. My name is Gabe Coyle. I'm the campus pastor here at Christ Communities Downtown Campus. And today's passage, in which we are going to be diving into a deeper detail as to what God has in store for us in heaven, is anchored in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 12. Hear now God's word to us. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to get a glimpse into heaven and how you are bringing it to earth and what and which ways that that shapes our community even now. So God, we pray, Lord, that you'd guide us in this time, give us the eyes to see and the ears to hear all that you have in store for us, for those who trust in Christ. We love you. Thanks for loving us first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, something that's fascinating that happens every year are these cringeworthy, awkward Christmas photos. We've all seen them. You think to yourself, man, this is extremely awkward. But at the same time, you think, there's no way I'm looking away, right? And some of these awkward Christmas photos, some people are trying too hard. Some people are not trying hard enough. And then there's this guy. What was I thinking? I can tell you what I was thinking. All I could think in that moment was, let's get this picture over with. I mean, what are parents thinking in these moments? Like, hey kids, I know you just got the most exciting toys in your life, but stop your elation and give me a forced smile. Hold it, hold it. And all kids think in that moment is, this is torture. And for adults, we end up with pictures like these. And yes, my kids do the same thing to me that I did to my parents. It's really, really great. So here's the question I wanna pose to us today. What picture of heaven do you have in mind? What picture of heaven do you have in mind? You see, here's the surprise when we think about the picture of heaven that comes into our minds. In reality, for some, heaven is going to feel like an awkward family photo. And it has everything to do with how God outfits his people. You see, few topics are as rife with misunderstanding as heaven. And this Advent, as we remember Jesus coming to us in the manger, we're also looking forward to what God will bring in Jesus' second coming, when heaven comes to earth. And finally, God's plan for wholeness is fully realized. But do we know what we're actually waiting for? And today we're going to see that heaven has everything to do with who is there. And of course, I mean Jesus, but I also mean more than that. You see, we're stepping back into the book of Revelation for today. And we get a glorious photo of the family God is creating for all eternity. But what is beautiful to some is going to feel like an awkward family photo to others. And it has to do, frankly, with what we do and how we respond today. So if you haven't already, would you please turn with me in your Bibles or your Bible apps to Revelation chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. And the first thing we need to do in the passage that was just read for us is to look at the context. You see, this is the second part of a two-part vision in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, we see that John hears that there's this extraordinary number of people from Israel who will be with him for eternity. And then when we come to verses, verses 9 and 10, we see that they are, as we see in the text, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the same multitude, actually, who sings to the Lamb back in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, a new song, where they say, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, speaking of the Lamb, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. 
You see, these folks are the followers of Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And instead of clothes soiled by their own sin and shame, they are clothed in the splendor of God's grace. Their deliverance comes from none other than the Lamb. And they give their allegiance exclusively to the Lamb. They serve His kingdom and they cry out with a loud voice in unison and praise to God and His Lamb. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is actually your inheritance. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, no matter where you come from or where you've been, where you grew up or what you've accomplished or where you failed, this is the heavenly family of which we are a part by God's grace through the Lamb. I mean, what a gift. And simultaneously, it's the kind of gift that just keeps on giving. Look back to the beginning of chapter 7, verse 9. We read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. You know what that means? For one, what we come to see is that there's a lot, of wear, a lot of ways to wear white. But John heard that it was Israel, right? But what he saw after he heard that it was Israel was actually a diverse multitude from across history and across the globe. The 144,000 is actually a symbolic number equating the perfect amount that God would redeem throughout history. And finally, we get a glimpse of how God was to fulfill his promise to Abraham to bless all the inhabitants of the earth. It started with Abraham and then, of course, the promised child, Isaac. His offspring were Israel, the nation as a whole, who was awaiting and pointing to the, two, the true Messiah who became King Jesus. And now everyone who holds fast to Jesus as their king, as the true Messiah, is a part and are also recipients of God's promises and considered part of God's people. It all comes down to the promised Messiah and what God has been doing, both pointing forward, pointing back, and now anticipating his return. And finally, we see what God has been wanting all along when he made that promise to Abraham. Here's what we need to expect when it comes to heaven and who's there. Are you ready? God wants a big, awkward family. That's right. God wants a big, awkward family. I mean, think about this. How does John notice that there are people from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages? The same way we would. And that means heaven isn't colorblind. God sees nationality. He sees ethnicity. He sees culture. For example, language as a, as a cultural artifact, as remarkable and beautiful, beautiful, so much so that he glorifies it into eternity. And God made sure John noticed them. And then John made sure that the church paid attention to them. So never is the church's response to diversity to be, I don't see color. You should, because God does, frankly, we should see color and we forever will. And see it as something beautiful and a part of the landscape of God's creativity. You see, God sees and celebrates diversity rather than downplaying it. He won't discourage Recognizing difference is something that divides us. And surely one day all sin and all weakness will be purified upon our entrance to heaven. And that includes all various kinds of cultures. But even still, it does not exclusively look like one particular culture, race, or nationality. Our identity in Christ is to be so secure that we can celebrate each other's various aspects of God's robust image in each other without becoming insecure in who we are created to be. Sure, it's not central, but it is still very, very important. Yana Connor, a Christian writer currently at the Ducent Research Group, says it best when she says, You've probably heard of the great hallelujah chorus that will take place around God's throne. People of every ethnicity will sing out in their native tongue the praises of God who redeemed their life from its awful pit. That's Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. What's significant about this holy gathering is that God didn't make their new heavenly bodies monolithic. He didn't make them all blue-eyed with fair skin or cocoa brown with curly locks. He allowed their ethnicity to pass over from the temporal to the eternal. That's how much he values ethnicity. That's how much he loves it. Native, Asian, black, and white, all are very precious in his sight. 
So I want you to imagine this with me. Yes, uh, we are going to share cross cultures, this allegiance to the Lamb, which is beautiful and frankly is absolutely central to this vision. Simultaneously, though, when we think about who will be there and whether they will resonate with the life we know or not, what's fascinating is that most folks that are there will have never had, to, never had the time to, to wait for Amazon shipping when it came to last-minute Christmas gifts. Most folks will never have seen any of the Home Alone movies, which sounds absurd, but seriously, most folks won't even speak English, or at least not current English as it pertains to the 21st century. Have you ever tried to read Elizabethan English? I mean, woweth, right? Most won't have lived in a suburb of anything. Most will have had a different national heritage than that of the USA. Remember, we're a baby country in the grand scheme of history. Most folks won't share your cultural upbringing. Most folks won't share your skin color. And yet, even in the midst of all this diversity, Christ is still central, yes, but look who surrounds him, this diverse group forever. So let me ask you, what feelings does that image stir up? What feelings are you feeling when you hear the description of this big, awkward family. If you feel anything other than overwhelming elation, because that's John's intention here, this is meant to stir the Christian to a deeper joy over what is to come into eternity, then something is still terribly wrong. When a beautiful picture actually conjures an ugly response, it's a good sign that sin still indwells. For example, I want you to check out this video. It's a recent video from Sansbury's. It's a British gravy company. And this is a commercial they made for this Christmas year. Take a look. Hey. Hey, it's me. Oh, hey, love. How are you? How's mum? Yeah, yeah, well, we're fine. We're all good, we're good. I'm getting so excited for Christmas. Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> I just really hope I can see you. Me too. I've literally, I cannot stop thinking about Mum's roasties. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what about my gravy? What about your gravy? Hey, you, what's going down? Dad, not the song. Gravy boat, gravy Dad, boat's stop. coming in town. Oh. It's not any old chip. Just take a seat. Dad. It's still a bit scrummy and oh. still safe bits. <laughs> <laughs> How does Mum put up with you? <laughs> Your gravy is pretty good, to be fair, and I just really want to be home for it. So my gravy is the best. Dad. Honey! She says my gravy is the best! <laughs> Honey! What did you see? Wasn't it awful? Of course not! It was extremely harmless. It was beautiful, actually. And yet, you know what the sort of responses they got on the internet from this commercial? All hell broke loose. Here are a couple examples of people's responses to Sansbury's commercial. One, you may as well rename yourself Blackberries. Two, where are the British people? Assuming because they were black, then they weren't true Brits. Three, you've managed to completely alienate the few remaining white customers you still had. You see, when a beautiful picture conjures up an ugly response, it is a symbol of deep, latent brokenness and sin. When you see this picture of heaven, or even if you're tired of pastors talking about this part of the picture of heaven, if that's true of you, and in some senses this is true of all of us because we're all still broken and wrestling, then repentance is key. Not just confession, which is a statement that something is wrong and an admittance to that, but repentance, which is saying it was wrong, and then you're willing to actually take a new and more redemptive path that breeds life where you're going. And frankly, I know for some of you, you long for this to be true someday, deep within your bones. But the other reality is that John wasn't just painting a picture of God's family someday. John wrote to encourage his readers to reflect the pattern of heaven in their life on earth. So what can we do now to better embrace our forever awkward family? I'm so glad you asked. Here's what we can do. Learn to sing awkward family carols. Yeah, learn to sing awkward family carols. You see, our culture loves to tout diversity for diversity's sake. It's better, well, because it is. Well, 
That's not a good response. And then when things get hard, then culture swings the opposite way. Culture throughout history has this oscillation between extremes. Not us as the people of God. We have a deeply robust framework of being made in the image of God and how each person, each nationality, each culture, when refined by the Spirit, and white culture needs that refining too, reveals part of the mosaic of God's beauty on earth. And there's something special about music. Music can both bring people together from all kinds of cultures and backgrounds, but it also is one of the best ways to kind of exhibit our differences and beauties. And this song in Revelation 7 has something to teach us. I call it a song even though we have no evidence that they explicitly sing it. Most scholars believe these are said by singing. And there are at least actually 15 songs across Revelation, probably more. Each come at really critical junctures in the book. So what do we see here that's so crucial? There is both a laser-focused unity centered on the one true God and the Lamb, as well as a diversity of mass proportions, which we have already detailed. There's harmony. Some of my favorite Christmas songs are sung in these old cathedrals, and they have various parts to them with various harmonies, bringing together a rich tapestry that just stirs the heart as you listen. Harmony by its very nature, is the combination of diverse musical notes sung together to produce chords having a pleasing effect. Unity without uniformity equals beauty. We need to learn to sing heaven's songs on earth. How do we do this? Well, we're going to look at two particular ways. For starters, you need to embrace your part. Some of us need to hear that your voice is even wanted. God hears you in all the unique characteristics that you bring to the table. He calls you beautiful because of his grace and how he has designed you. He wants you to be a part of his family. That's why he sent his son to actually go to the depths of death to redeem you. And he won't whitewash you. Rather, your culture, your gender, your ethnicity, and more is refined to be truly you as defined by the gospel and simultaneously more truly you perfect. You see, in the gospel, we hear you are wanted, you are loved, you are included if you embrace the lamb. This is why he came to die. So embrace your part. Get to know your part and where God has you. Study your own culture. Study your own nationality, your own ethnicity, because it isn't going anywhere. Everyone has a culture. There is no part of life that is not shaped by a culture, and no culture is neutral. So get to know yours. While there are parts of our, all of our stories that need mending and correcting, the goal isn't to shame, but understanding, and at times, repentance, and always, growth. So number one, embrace your part. Number two, listen for the parts of others. If we're going to learn to sing awkward family carols, we have to learn to listen to one another. You can't just focus on yourself. You have to have an ear for who you're singing with. Are we in balance? Is there harmony? What's the cadence? And so on. And when we pray, as Jesus has taught us, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are, among other things, asking God to set his Revelation 7-9 choir in our midst, to free us from our cultural silos and give us an ear for Zion's praise. Since most minorities have to learn about white majority culture just to survive in our context, I have no problem saying that white Christians have a weightier onus here. Not exclusively, but definitely more so. Therefore, white brothers and sisters, I continue to encourage the long-term habits. These aren't just one and done, but the long-term habits of reading books and listening to podcasts by Asian, African-American, Latinx Christian brothers and sisters. Listen when your minority brothers and sisters lament the systemic injustices they experience and lament with them rather than coming with a skeptical or dismissive tone. You can come to the underground. That's a great place to learn about what God is doing in, the com com in combating oppression and distortion throughout history. It's also a great moment to learn about church history. That's coming up the first weekend of February. You can also come to our first Friday in February. We have a whole series of experiences where we continue to learn as a church. We're passionate 
about continuing to listen well to the parts of others as a church. And we believe this is going to be a catalyst to deeper empathy and reconciliation, re reconciliation, which is central to what God is doing. One more idea, okay? Every church is going online these days. And there are any, so many different churches, like Charlie Date's church in Chicago, which is an exceptional expositional church that is predominantly African-American, that you can listen in on the regular in addition to joining us here when you watch your Sunday morning. Because only when we listen and only when we embrace our own part can we sing these awkward family carols together in all their glory. Only when we listen to each other will we be able to sing these awkward family carols together in all their glory. And I know this is hard, right? None of this is easy. There's not any simple answers. It's not just about simply getting people even in a room. It's seeking life in Christ together both on Sunday and Monday. And sometimes it's about reaching out to people in your workplace or even across a Zoom call. And that is the slow, long slog that the gospel calls us to. I mean, and as hard as that is, got to ask yourself, well, what's the alternative? Are we to miss out on the taste of heaven today? And to do that misses what God is doing now into heaven, which is really important. In the words of a prophet whose martyred blood continues to stain this land, Martin Luther King Jr., he says, We are bound together in a single garment of destiny. And he died because of his hold on to heaven not just his hold on to earth. And so many today say that if they would have been around in the 60s or the 70s, they would have been different. They would have stood for rights. And yet the charge of Jesus to the hypocrites in Matthew chapter 23, verses 30 through 31 is as real today as it was then. When he says to the Pharisees, if, you, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. Thus you witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. It's hard, but we can't just move on, ignore it, and lean into comfort. We have to continue to engage reconciliation, advocacy today. And the whole of the New Testament is working this out as if this is absolutely essential to the church accomplishing its mission that it's called to. We see Jesus was never content with just redeeming one ethnicity, one gender, one culture. He wants all. As we see in Matthew 28, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, right? Not just a particular one. You see throughout the New Testament, throughout Paul's letters, he's consistently trying to get Jews and Gentiles to collaborate together, to actually be in the same church together, to see each other, and to love one another as this new humanity. He even goes so far in the letter of Philemon, an oft-overlooked letter, where he's writing on behalf of a runaway slave to a master, encouraging them to reconcile, but actually asking the master to sing back up and allow for the freedom of Onesimus. And then, of course, we come to the climax in Revelation here. But really, all of these songs, all of that that we're seeing consistently, consistently being played out across the New Testament, anchored all the way back in the promises of Abraham in the Old Testament, they really point to a song that was sung one night in a field. A song announcing the birth of the one who would create this awkward family. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. You see, the angels couldn't keep quiet. This is a song we're all invited to sing. And it's going to feel awkward sometimes. It may sound different at other times, but in the end, all of heaven will be full of its melody with different languages and dialects. Some will be stoic. Others will be uninhibited in emotion. There will be Israelis next to Palestinians, whites next to blacks, Irish alongside of one another, left-wingers next to right-wingers, men and women of all stripes and time periods singing together. And as awkward as that may sound to comprehend, this is the picture of heaven that's truly incomparable. And like a proud father smiling behind the camera, it's as if God is just waiting for his kids to get in their places. Will we? Will we joyfully join God's awkward family? Will we embrace our part and listen for the parts of others? And so learn to sing awkward 
family carols. I hope so. I want to sing. Will you join me? Let's pray. Almighty God, we say thank you for your grand vision that you seek to exclude no one who embraces your Son and your Son only. And we recognize that the spirit you've even placed within us is bilingual, singing, Abba, Father, communicating a deep diversity and an avenue that meets us in our own cultural realities. And so we come praying Jesus' high priestly prayer that you would bring about a deep unity across diversity, that we would know a oneness one with another in the same way that Jesus and the Father are one. God, only by your spirit is this possible. We trust in your work and what you will do. Guide us even now. In Jesus' name we do pray together. Amen, amen, amen. And now we turn to a meal that is meant to showcase God's gloriously awkward family. And it's supposed to be awkward even when we partake in it, right? That's a bit meta, God. He, he knew what he was doing. Um, because the reality is it's just a little messy. You've got people from all different cultural backgrounds and socioeconomic backgrounds coming together to remember one Lord and to eat a meal together. So if you're a follower of Jesus and you have those elements available and you have friends or family around, we, I invite you to, to gather everyone together and partake in remembrance of Christ. But before you do, let's remember what's been handed down to us. For the Lord Jesus, on the night when he's betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whenever you're ready, eat, remember, and look forward to the glorious, awkward family surrounding the Lamb.
And now we've come to the time in our service where we go into a benediction moment. And this is a word of blessing as we all go off to our various vocations and callings. And as we do around here, we raise a hand just as a symbol of receiving this blessing. The words of Paul from 2 Corinthians 13. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Welcome to Revelation 7. <laughs> yeah, oh, right, 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 yeah, right, uh, yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I almost started laughing. <laughs> I don't know if you saw me start smiling. <laughs>